Welcome. Welcome to the uh, Law, Technology, and Public Policy course here at UMKC. It's a graduate level uh, interdisciplinary course, though we have several undergraduates participating as well. This is uh, the fifth anniversary of the, uh, of the course. We started in the fall of 2014. We decided to have a studio type course where we worked on um, varied uh, projects. I inspired somewhat by a friend at the MIT Media Lab, as a Greenwood, who uh, talked about studio courses they had there, and a fellow named Jonathan Askin, who grew up in law school, we were connected with through the Kaufman Foundation, we had a conference here with a lot of folks. And this course ensued, and it's been one of our favorite things because uh, it's uh, not only faculty and students, uh, full of people from the community who attach themselves to our teams as mentors, who send us projects, and so I thought when we get started here before the students get up and make their presentations, I might introduce some of the guests here who helped us right along. So, Abby Ecker, who is an assistant to the Chief Innovation Officer of Kansas City, Kansas, Unified Government of Wyandotte County, and who took this course in the, in the, in the past. Paul Barn, who is the captain of Code for KC, part of the Code for American Brigade. Scott, you're now so official, I'm not sure if you're a guest or not. Scott's that adjunct with us now. He, he's been working with teams. He's working with one particular team. Now that's Scott Stockwell. He's an attorney here in the Kansas City region and been a friend of the course for several years now. Leslie Scott, who I call tech-savvy community activist who cares a lot about a lot of things. But what's your, you have an official title? That's Is that much good? Up. That's pretty much <laughs> And teaches us a lot of things and she also was involved with the course when we first started the first the first semester um, okay and we have rick usher who is assistant city manager for entrepreneurship and small business in kansas city missouri has been in the classroom for five years starting with the very first semester we we're I'm slow learner. information bulletin 110 is that they still have that right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. we started with trying to streamline permitting processes and then got into all kinds of stuff Alex Brasco, who is the current Chief Innovation Officer in Kansas City, Missouri, who has also sent us projects both in this class and outside, and lots of things we have students working on. And Amanda Grayor, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at MARC, the American Regional Council. Uh, so we may have other guests coming in, too, if they can fight the weather and call me for parking pass. That's, that's where we are. Um, so what we're going to do, we have three projects tonight. Uh, we're going to go in this order. The first one is called Regulation of Autonomous Vehicles and Other Robotic Devices. We're going for a uh, long title. There's Jim Morelli, another friend of the course, who's been a mentor with us for pretty much the whole time as well. Do you need a parking pass? What? Are you, are you okay with the parking pass? Uh, I just parked on the street. Okay. Lost You're good. Yeah, like oh, I should say hi to our Facebook Live group, right, Greg? Yep. Yep. Hello. Hello. We have one viewer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who it is. Comment and say hello. Hello. <laughs> Tell them to comment. Okay. So that's the first project. The second one is one that we call Health Outcomes Disparities, also known as Health Equity Team, which has an interesting kind of subpart to it this time you'll hear about. And the third project is Clear My Record. It's about criminal records expungement. You'll hear about that one as well. Uh, we told the students to try to stay on track at a 20 minute presentation. And then we'll have uh, five or ten minutes after each one for feedback from the audience, questions, suggestions. We usually get a lot of good suggestions uh, at this session. So that's how we'll operate. Since we are on Facebook Live, the students have all kind of agreed to that. Those who are guests, if you uh, want to make comments and you don't want to be heard on, then you slip a note or something and you can be anonymous and I'll read the question. Uh, or, or, you know, if you're okay with it, just shout it out. Uh, okay, so I'll let the students introduce themselves. First team here, regulation of autonomous vehicles and other robotic devices. Longest title. Uh, thank you. Uh, as uh, Professor Pino just said, we are a group that was doing a lot of studies on the regulation of connected autonomous vehicles and other robotic devices. Uh, we were split up into three teams. Uh, we tried to make sure that, uh, that there were law students and computer engineering students involved in each team. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is how our teams broke down eventually, uh, focused on things such as uh, connected autonomous vehicles for transporting people, uh, delivery devices, uh, and drones, type that, fly. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
we talked about uh, three principal lines of inquiry. These were the main, some main questions that we asked uh, that carried along all groups. Uh, what is the current state of technology? Where is it headed? Uh, the extent. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, the extent of, of uh, extent of evidence for cost versus benefit analysis regarding deployments of the device. We want to make sure that uh, there was some good business research done. Would that be better? Can you see the screen up there? That that's great. And uh, the regulatory landscape, uh, both all three uh, regarding uh, federal, state, and local statutes. Uh, how we went about this, uh, essentially we went, we looked at last semester's final report to see, to make sure that we were asking the right questions and we were carrying along properly. Um, we made sure to conduct interviews with knowledgeable people, because uh, that's Really the foundation of any good research. And um, we made sure that we knew what each other was doing so we weren't asking the same questions over and over. Uh, and I will be passing this off to group for uh, autonomy vehicles transporting people. <coughs> so we looked at uh, autonomous vehicles transporting people, so this being uh, either uh, cars for individuals or shuttles. Um, that was me and Brett. Brett is not here at the moment. Uh, so for this, we have conducted two interviews, one with David Modi, he's a former professor of Clemson University, and we're looking at the technology of the current technology for these connected autonomous vehicles. And then uh, Ms. Erin Campbell is a research librarian of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. And she helped us with some questions about uh, legal liability and how um, the industry itself could look at, especially if we look at insurance for a metric for safety. Uh, as far as the state of technology goes, uh, famous kind of like line will be uh, Waymo cars aren't really driving the road, they drive on a map. And so as they drive around the city more, they get better at uh, their map. Uh, this is kind of compared to the Tesla approach, which uses their onboard sensors to make decisions. Uh, the AAA also did a study on automatic braking with pedestrians. This would be current technology in cars where you see safety coming out. Uh, it's 2019 Malibu or a Tesla Model 3 and a Toyota Camry. And they looked at that and they found that. Uh, at 20 miles an hour, an accident with an adult pedestrian was avoided about 40% of the time. Um, and 35% of the time, it was mitigated by four and a half miles per hour, which really kind of goes to show the improvements that we need to make. Um, because this is the technology that we have now that is popular, and there isn't necessarily a broad understanding in the, what goes into that. Uh, David Bodie also mentioned that gaming graphic cards manufacturers uh, showed the improvements in the software and hardware that the vehicles would be using, and that the social, social negotiations between computers and people are the most difficult to implement algorithmically. Um, so while there isn't really much of a cost benefit analysis in general for using connected autonomous vehicles, and so we kind of did some research into what we thought were the main points of it. Uh, we noticed that Paris ended their autonomous shuttle project after about two years. Uh, they cited novelty and the difficulty with navigation and the low speed. It had an average speed of seven kilometers an hour for two years, which is really slow. Um, and no one really used it. Uh, they are, but we also see with the safety impact uh, the kind of simulations that have been done with this, uh, at 94 accidents, 94 percent of accidents are cited as uh, human error. They want to see uh, what percentage of these could be mitigated by using CFEs. So that's 25 percent of the share. They estimated 12 to 47 percent. That's a wide range, but you see that range narrow down and go up as you get more connected autonomous vehicles as the market share on the road. Uh, and a um, study by the Rand Corporation found that drivers had external costs of about uh, 
dollars for every 10,000 miles that they drive. And that's just kind of the insurance costs they put on other people, as well as the infrastructure and uh, a whole lot of things that go into that beyond what they incur themselves. And the other problem with on street testing is that you're using the city as kind of a lab rat because you need to do yeah, in person testing basically because we have no way of simulating this uh, well. 50% of large American cities are considering TAVs currently. Uh, as far as how they can handle them and no longer plans with regulation. And an FBI bulletin in 2017 raised a couple of uh, questions legally as far as enforcement goes, uh, especially with how the software will handle interactions with what we currently do already. It's uh, beyond the social negotiation of just navigating the city, but also traffic enforcement. Um, the biggest one here I see is like, are they malfunctioning or are they violating traffic laws? And then how do you handle all that to begin with? Uh, connection autonomous vehicles. Uh, part of the regulation we have in Missouri, there were a couple of proposed bills, but they all focused on one or two specific things, either with uh, being able to test in the state of Missouri, platooning, or uh, perceived job loss with uh, exchanging fleet vehicles for autonomous uh, vehicles. The UK especially, um, created the non statutory best practices for testing as a way to do their due diligence, but without creating uh, further hurdles to innovation. And that is kind of what they decided to go with that route right there. California has a couple different permitting systems, and they are probably one of the most developed as far as regulations goes. And they have no deployed currently uh, permitting, but they do have a driverless permit, and that is uh, Waymo. Uh, I, driverless permit for on the road. Uh, but they do have, there are some policy concerns. The most cited would be the data security ownership that are created by these vehicles that have all the sensors on them, uh, privacy of people in the vehicle and on the road, as well as the liability of uh, causing accidents and uh, everything that goes with that. So uh, of this report, we kind of have some implications of questions about the consistency of the updates that you would have to do to CAVs and how that could impact the industry model uh, towards a service model. Uh, we see that with software a lot, uh, if you have any Adobe products. Um, and so that could possibly be an area for them. Um, we also need the permanently generated data to assess risk uh, with insurers. That is kind of a question, like how do we generate this? Is it going to end up with partnerships with a lot of companies specifically sharing that data with this, you know, the state farm going to be the preferred insurer of your GM car? Um, and then what standard are we going to hold autonomous vehicles to? Uh, is it just better than humans? Or is it going to be that uh, perfect standard because it's machine that we can control and we can think about all these problems that they incur? For as long as we want. Um, and so, future steps could be specific analysis of the 18th Street shuttle, which was kind of given to us as a test case. Uh, if this was to be implemented in Kansas City as a shuttle, do we think this is beneficial and how, why would we go about doing this? Um, so, specifically looking at how we can go about doing this. The next team that would be presenting is going to be the robotic delivery devices on the ground. Yeah. All right. uh, my name is Juan Williams. I didn't know about that. This is. Okay, thank you, And uh, we study essentially delivery vehicles, autonomous delivery vehicles, and uh, how that will be brought about. Um, <clears throat> so we have a fairly uh, wide range of people that we got to interview. Um, one being Amanda Greer, who was here today, uh, Dr. David Bodie, um, which I don't believe he's here today, uh, Mr. Rick Usher, and Bob Simmons, uh, all of them had a very, very different uh, input on a lot of the questions that we asked, uh, and it was 
appreciate because they did offer a lot of different perspectives. Um, going on. Uh, currently, um, there are there are deployments for autonomous delivery vehicles. Um, none currently for uh, the city of Kansas City, but um, a lot of it was had to do with uh, what was the George Mason University and Berkeley University. So we're seeing a lot of deployments on college campuses. Um, we're seeing that there's a priority with uh, home delivery versus commercial delivery. Uh, this, there, there were a few studies done, uh, I believe, with the last group where there was a lot of platooning, but we're not seeing that occur in uh, city streets as of yet. Um, also, there's a high priority on necessities being delivered versus uh, entertainment, things like um, medicines and uh, groceries. Um, and um, <laughs> um, one thing that uh, was brought about that we saw through our interviews uh, was that there wasn't a lot of cross-disciplinary education for people that actually have to make these policies. So what you have are people who are uh, obligated to make the policies, who are obligated to have an a understanding to determine which is best for the city, um, and they don't necessarily have access to all of the, the data that they need to make those kinds of decisions. So cost-benefit analysis, a couple of things that we learned from some of the interviews and the research that we did about package delivery unions, so the Teamsters are the package delivery people, you know, long haul truck drivers, medium around town, and one of the things that they have done is you would think that initially they would have concerns and not want to support this, but they actually have an aging workforce, and they have a lack of new workers coming in. So, in about 10 years, we'll have 160,000 openings for long haul truck drivers on a gap in full positions. The average age of the workforce is 46. So we need to get some new people in there, and if we're not having new people come into the, to the workforce to do those jobs, then the technology, the gap that technology could help with might be able to help support that, um, that industry. Also, the con, I mean, I mean, the cons of skill gap, skill gap, if there are people that are trained to drive trucks, they wouldn't necessarily be trained to monitor autonomous vehicles. So they have to be retraining and things like that, maybe a whole different types of people that they'd be recruiting into the union to work for that. So that's an interesting thing to think about. Also, there's a robot tax been suggested from a couple of different people. Basically, this would require companies to pay an additional tax if they use robotic devices instead of humans. A recent study I found estimated that the gap in income tax would be about $13 billion in a year if we automated a lot of things that we're thinking about automating. So obviously that would be something that we want to try to fix because that has all kinds of downstream effects. And this tax may also discourage entry into the market as well. Um, cost benefits depend on the type of deployment. So these are three things that we've found in types of deployments. The drop deploy return model, and basically that is one of the pictures, I'm going to go back, I have to show you these pictures, see this one right here, the inbound, so it operates like a dog almost, and they put them in, put a bunch of them in the delivery vehicle, and it goes out, and they all go out and do the package delivery, and they come back to the same place, right? So that is the drop and deploy model. Um, these two are more, the Kiwi and the Starship are more the end-to-end -end delivery, so it's going to the place, picking up food, or whatever it is, taking it to the person, and dropping it off. The other one in the middle is the walk along one. I don't have a picture of this, but um, DHL, the package delivery service, they have thing, something called a post bot. It's not here, it's in Europe somewhere, but it's a follow along model. So if the person's delivering packages, it carries a bunch of packages and kind of like walks behind them. They can just get the package out, deliver it, that kind of thing. Um, so it just depends on what model you want to adopt, what your cost benefit could be. So as far as regulation goes, We've been able to find that they've been calling these personal delivery devices or PDDs. Um, and there's eight states that have laws currently that are on the books about them. There's actually six municipalities 
bigger ones that you might think. Uh, they govern weight size, control the vehicle, insurance, low capacity interaction with pedestrians. So they are supposed to, for regulation, for statute, um, waive right of way for pedestrians. So how do they do that? Well, it doesn't really say in the statute how to do that. It just says that the pedestrians have the right way for them. Um, they must have a braking system. They have to have front and rear lights if they're operating from dusk until dawn. General liability insurance of not less than $100,000, which doesn't seem like very much. So that's within the statute. And I assume there's probably some lobbying to keep that down. But um, as Richard said, the, the cost can be enormous for these types of things. It must be actively controlled by someone. And less than 90 pounds, that's a 10 mile per hour max. So federal Department of transportation, they've issued some guidance for states and municipalities. Really. Their guidance is more focused on motor vehicles, so autonomous shuttle, people movers, cars, things like that. Uh, they do make sure to say that the federal regulations supersede any state motor vehicles, but these aren't really motor vehicles we're talking about. They don't fall into that category, so there's been a lot of guidance on that. There's some other federal issues to consider. Um, ADA, I know we met with uh, Amanda, she talked a little bit about the different types of access ways. So curb to curb, door to door, through door, through the door, through door, through. So there's some considerations with that, how these would have to be able to serve people in all types of situations like that. And then also, interestingly, Department of Homeland Security, which I'm sure is interested in everything, but one of the things that they have published a couple of different reports on is the use of these as weapons. So they want to make sure that we're not having people hack into them and use them as weapons to deploy remotely somewhere. <clears throat> Um, the biggest question that we have is what problem does this solve? I mean, obviously there's some problems you could think of, but is it just kind of nice to have, or is it something that's really going to be beneficial? Um, what are the highest and best uses? Is it convenience versus actual need-based things for people that can't get out to get medicines? Um, what are the gaps in current laws? Obviously, well, the law's usually behind, so there's probably a lot of gaps there. And then we've contemplated a few appendices, you know, the current regulation I mentioned before, list of current implementations, and cost benefit calculations in April. So now, All right. Uh, then we're kind of running a little on time here, so I'm going to have to give you a little bit of Sparkman's version of this. Um, but yeah, so we were the drugs team. Uh, basically, our project focused on uh, regulation of drones, mostly focusing on uh, recreational use, not so much commercial. Um, and so these are some of the few interviews that we did. I uh, talked with Chris Davis, Al Ken. Uh, those are both just uh, people in the Kansas City area that use their drones. Uh, Dr. Travis Fields, and as well as um, the, the one I'm thinking here. I didn't want to do that interview. <laughs> um, so our outstanding interviews, some that we have here, uh, the ones that I think are most important appear to the uh, Consumer Technology Association and the Association of Automated Vehicle Systems uh, International. Those are two. Uh, um, lobbying groups uh, for drones. They actually wrote some letters. There's a, a ordinance put out in Prairie Village. They wrote letters in opposition there. So I thought we thought it'd be a good idea to reach out to those um, organizations to kind of get their idea of what they think these regulations, these ordinances should look like. Have not heard back from them uh, except for three emails. So we'll see if we get anything from them. Um, and then the current state right now, there is a lot of respect for the drone community. I mean, uh, it seems kind of obvious people don't like being told to do by the government. The government's saying, well, hey, you can't fly your drone here. Uh, they don't love that very much. Uh, so kind of the focus of this project, a lot of it being that we want to find a way that we can implement these ordinances in order to safely regulate these drones, make sure they're being used correctly in the community without uh, having people in that community feel like you know, their, their reps are, are being trampled on uh, by the government, local, state, federal, or whichever one. Um, so, again, like I said, we're just trying to hit that sweet spot and balance those rights. Um, as far as the regulations, uh, these are some of the uh, regulations we got. We found as far as state and local. Um, the closest one would be the Prairie Doors. That's one we focused on a lot. Chicago, um, we know has the strictest uh, regulations of any city uh, in the country. Um, and like I said, we're going to have a little bit of time here. Um, as far as the enforcement of those regulations, uh, like I said, most cities don't really want to get into commercial regulation. They want to leave that up to the FAA. Um, and a lot of cities, especially talking with uh, Wes Jordan, who was the city administrator for Prairie Village, and is uh, largely responsible for the implementation of that Prairie Village ordinance. 
Uh, he did not seem very confident that those ordinances would even hold up in court law if they were challenged. He's not sure if those are constitutional or not. Uh, and as far as cost benefit analysis, here's Gina. Thanks, Ben. You're welcome. So, lastly, in looking at drones themselves, we did a cost benefit analysis. And as you can see here on this slide, there are several different types of drone use. The top one being commercial, which is what we focused on when we did the cost benefit analysis, but it's important to note that the commercial use also encompasses some of the logistics for delivery items, as well as the bottom R&D. So when looking at a cost benefit analysis for drones, first cost or benefit, I'm sorry, first cost or risk would be the purchase price. In speaking with commercial businesses, specifically a green power company that's international out of Nevada, they created an in-house drone unit for their company. And so that initial cost was $30,000 per drone. So investing that money ahead of time is certainly going to take some budgeting, but the maintenance after that is pretty minimal. So there's that initial upfront cost. There's also the licensing and insurance from the commercial side and making sure that every person that's flying a drone or using it for the company is licensed through the FAA and has ongoing training if there's updates to technology or new regulations come down the way. Insurance is also another big cost and risk as you've heard the rest of the group talk about. It's new. Insurance companies aren't sure exactly how to capture drones and companies have often been looking for attorneys that specialize in drone law, which there aren't a lot of them either. And so companies are trying to figure out what this insurance looks like, how much they pay for it, and what the end liability will be as well. There's also concern about job elimination. And when we were conducting our research, we didn't find a lot of hard data on what that looks like yet. And for instance, if you have a crew of men and women that are going out to survey a land, whether it's for a utility or for farming, they may send out two or three people depending on the project, whereas those two or three people could also be trained to fly these drones and then that time could be better spent in other areas. So the job, the job elimination piece is still really new and there's not a lot of data behind it yet. Lastly is the legal implications. Again, kind of going on the insurance side of things as well as the regulatory and sharing the airspace between airplanes and drones. What does that look like? It's not very regulated yet, and they don't always speak to each other. <clears throat> However, in moving over to the benefit side, one great thing about drones in the commercial space is you have real-time data collection. So if you're sending drones out into the field, you're capturing that information immediately. You're not waiting for a team to write it down or input it and then send it or transmit it to a company. You're collecting it as it happens. And that lends to our second bullet of your cash flow management and cost reduction for a company. You're able to make real-time decisions instead of waiting on a lag of information that comes in later. And then looking at this on a micro scale, studies have found that in the next 10 years, they're going to see an increase of 100,000 jobs specifically in the drone area. And then looking at other studies, they found that from 2015 and projecting out to 2025, they're going to see an increase of around $80 billion in the airspace itself, which does include drones, but it's not specifically drone oriented. And then lastly, building on the real-time data collection, you have real-time surveillance. That can also be a bit of a risk because of First Amendment issues, but what we were focusing on here is more if there's an airplane crash or if there's a wildfire, something where we need to get someone out there immediately, there's going to be that real-time surveillance instead of sending a crew out. Lastly, in looking at our implications and considerations for our final write-up, we continue, or we're going to continue to look at what problems do drones solve. Other than the commercial aspects we just talked about, what else could they potentially be used for? And where do we see the laws trending? It's heavily regulated by the FAA, but not really at the state or local level. So what is that going to look like for Kansas City or for other states? And where is drone technology headed in the next five years? Can we anticipate what that'll look like in looking at commercial businesses such as Amazon or other carriers that are using drones to deliver items? And then lastly, in our overall report, all three teams plan to list all of our interviews conducted, our mentors throughout the program, as well as our cost-benefit analysis of each three sub-teams and the legal landscape, and just what the regulations look like. So we appreciate you listening if you have any questions.
Now, let me just make a comment as we segue into the questions. Uh, year after year, we found in the course that this part of it where questions and suggestions come from all of you factors directly into their final report that's due in about three weeks. So please don't be shy about it, making suggestions or asking questions. Leslie. So um, I, right at the beginning of your presentation, I actually had to leave to answer a call from an Amazon driver because nobody can ever deliver my package correctly. However, um, I'm, so I'm wondering, like the implications for the gig economy are huge in this, obviously, um, and the, the truck driving uh, profession as well, even though you indicated the, the gap that there's, they're going to have and the aging uh, workforce, but there are people who make a living at that, right? So are we going to be able to shift all those folks over to the drone world? And are we going to have in public policy any, um, I don't know, community benefit agreements, reskilling, um, you know, Elected officials push back on policy a lot when job losses are, are at risk. So did you see anything in your research that showed um, that elected officials are starting to think about that as they craft these laws? Answer, I'll just speak quickly to the drone piece. I didn't find anything from drones because what we're finding mainly with drones is that they are used by the military for larger productions. And so in the commercial sector, it's still very new to where deliveries are very small items. And at this point, I believe it's more of a novelty in delivering more than it would be taking away from jobs. But I mean, I can speak to, to her area. Yeah, the only public policy kind of pushback that I found was on the robot tax, and that really hasn't been widely adopted. To your point about shifting those resources, one of the things I did read was you know, there's been a huge explosion in delivering packages to your door rather than going to the store and buying them. So I feel like so what they've been saying is that we need more, we're having more packages delivered so we can utilize this technology to deliver the same number of packages, actually exponentially more packages, more efficiently and using the same types of drivers. So there should be some movement of those drivers to those work jobs to stay or to move to a, a like a wall along rehouse becoming the robot coming behind and you're taking the deliveries like door by door. So that's kind of what we found. I didn't find a lot of specific pushback though at this point. Whether it's um, from the ordinance perspective or not, um, whether it's going to be the FAA controlling the airspace and there's the designation of 400 feet below for drones and 500 feet above for aircraft, <clears throat> the identification of where drones are, specifically in a city, is going to be crucial to be able to enforce any regulations. So I would ask that as a part of your project, you look at what technologies exist to get real-time situational awareness of the drones, uh, what technologies exist to be able to identify the owners of the drones, um, to look at beyond line of sight drones, okay, uh, just all the implications of those things. Sure. You guys said something really interesting at the beginning of your presentation about um, how you benchmark technology to human traits. If you were talking about, um, oh gosh, I think you were specifically talking about the braking in the vehicle and how, I guess, how you would identify, you know, what standard do we hold this technology to? Is it supposed to be, um, you know, at the same rate of error as a human? Is it well, what is that? Well, when you guys are talking about insurance, what's interesting to me is that that's kind of a torque critter, and you're dealing with negligence, right? Well, favorite thing in negligence is talking about the reasonable person standard. So, have you guys thought anything about when you're looking at the idea of benchmarking um, the success rate of this technology with? that, you know, that common law uh, foundation. I mean, that was kind of considered like, uh, yes, is this vehicle going to be more safe than a human in the same position? Mm -hmm. um, that could be true, but just the novelty of it not being uh, a driver there, uh, they don't have like the like pressure, like split second decision, split second decision I'm just gonna mm -hmm. spin left. Um, and just like the higher criticism that we are going to do, 
Because so, yes, we could like legally say, okay, we just need to be this as good as a person. Mm -hmm. um, but then public opinion of this, like I'm not in control of this thing, I'm trusting my life, mm -hmm. and I, it's going to be as good as me driving. Like that kind of standard, I don't think would go over well with public opinion, even if it is at the root of the same. I tend to agree. I think there's an expectation for a cushion of innovation when we deploy a technology like that. I think it's a really good assessment. I'm interested to hear what you guys want. So I was curious for the autonomous vehicle group. I, I don't think that what was on your slide was necessarily an exhaustive list of places that you'd look for or like states and countries and all of that, but specifically because you're looking at the things that Abby was talking about, I was surprised to see Arizona not on that list since that is one of the most high profile instances of testing and, and open for business policies related to autonomous vehicles and the human element impact. Um, you might also, uh, you mentioned there's no real way to test in real world conditions. And so I don't know how much you looked into M-City, the facility up in Ann Arbor that has replicated real world road conditions and does testing for something like 60 industry groups. There you go. Yeah. So, so you got three weeks. Yeah. So it, yeah, it, um, it's up in Ann Arbor. It's part of the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute, but they have created like a 30-acre site where they have gravel roads and railroad crossings and pedestrian and roundabouts and left turns and signals and all of this stuff that are consistent with current conditions that they actually test the vehicles on. So there are things out there. Okay. Okay. Very good. Take your notes. I took notes. So you have a question, maybe we have to tackle like one or two more questions, so we have to move on to the next year. Yeah, well, um, with respect to the insurance in the robotic vehicles, some indicated uh, or the delivery vehicles to indicate there was a liability uh, insurance requirement of hundred thousand dollars. And then in the autonomous vehicle part, you talked about uh, um, claims might be uh, some multiple of what would normally be if there were a human driver. And so I'm just thinking if, if there were something that the community was trying to regulate and understand, it might be a good idea for uh, the users of that that, that uh, autonomous vehicle to have to report to the the government um, what the what the amount of those um, claims are, so that they can see whether or not the insurance requirements fit uh, the certainty. I just let's do the last word, Jim. Okay, I have, I have three quick comments. Three last words. Okay, um, the drones, if they're used to deliver, I see another benefit. Maybe this isn't even reported and I just missed it. But, you know, right now Amazon has, has tested some, but they also have all those vans going out, and uh, they could be greener than the delivery vans, although Amazon is shifting to electrical cars in over 20 years or something like that. But that's another benefit is green, you know. Greenness and drone delivery. Um, then at the end of the drone report, there were three like open questions, but I felt like we might be able to get some answers to those. And I was like thinking that that would enhance your final report if you had some projections as to these three important questions. And then to Abby's point about whether you know this is really a torch critter and govern. Um, I'm wondering if it's really more going to be a products liability question as to the manufacturer. Very good. All right, very good. Thank you, group. Yeah. group. Thank you. Team, a few comments. We had some people uh, come in. First of all, this team had a few other late breaking things they were given, including the uh, grant application that the KCATA put in for a shuttle at 18th Street. They're going to be studying that. And we're going to be looking at a proposal apparently in Singapore where one of the issues with, with uh, driverless cars is being on the road with people who are driving. Mm -hmm. They don't mix so well. Singapore is giving some thought to having a no driver situation there. So I just wanted to uh, introduce a few people quickly who came in. Uh, John? Hey. John Stamm, he's the mayor's chief of staff in Kansas City, Missouri. Good to see you. Proud of him at UMKC as well. Thank yeah. you for joining us. Yeah. Uh, and it, actually, he, him being here, and Alex and, uh, and Rick remind me. You know, one of the slides was about finding people saying other parts of the country that there's not enough cross-disciplinary education of policymakers. And one of the things several of you know about, but maybe not everybody, and I brought copies, is the city council in Kansas City, Missouri, recently adopted by resolution 
an emerging technology board is really a proposal Alex made and a lot of us vetted and we had a workshop here with about 50 people from the community. It calls for on these kinds of endeavors trying to regulate uh, new devices, for example, um, a range of subject matter expertise, required community input, input from several city departments that are kind of cross-cutting, and driven by core principles that this needs to be human-centered so that when we talk about cost-benefit analysis, how does this relate, the resolution says, to the city's strategic goals, whether it's housing or healthcare. And so uh, I think we're on a good track there and all of you get to participate in that. Uh, also, in terms of cross-disciplinary, I was uh, negligent myself in not introducing Brian Hare, who for several years, he's, with, he's a professor at the School of Computing and Engineering, and for several years has taught a course in ethics and computing and engineering, an anchor course in our gen ed program, and sends several students that get attached to the uh, teams in the law, technology, and public policy class. Two of them were up in the last group, and we had a couple students, two students here from Brian's class as well. And I think the last person I missed was adjunct professor Chris Kopecki from the law school, who has helped with the criminal records expungement project we're going to hear about as the third project. So, you folks. Can I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I just want um, to Leslie's point about elected officials. In the three years that I've been working on this, in every presentation, without fail, that elected officials are in the audience, someone asks about jobs and reskilling. Yeah, every sure. single time, without fail, for the, all of the years I've been making this presentation. So, it's absolutely, it, it is absolutely on mind. All right, Sarah, take it away. All right, I'm Sarah. Our team, Daniel, Michael, and Matthew. Um, we are the Health Outcomes Disparities and Health Equity Team, kind of also a long name. Uh, the, we split into two sub teams, and so uh, it's the two of us and the two of them are the two sub teams. I couldn't come up with anything more creative than Health Equity Team for my side. Um, so there it is. Uh, we have some different uh, backgrounds that we bring into this, which has been really helpful. Uh, the principal objectives for this project is a continuation and expansion on a project uh, on health outcomes disparities from the 2019 spring semester. Um, the objectives remain the same for the most part, but they definitely expanded in the way that they help inform and support the work of UMKC's Health Equity Institute, which was launched earlier this year. Um, and I actually had an interview yesterday where I was able to learn more about that. Um, it also to help inform and support the work of the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion, um, since digital inclusion is one of the many components of pursuing health equity. So, uh, further, we wanted to uh, focus and connection with those objectives and uh, identification of relevant resources in the Kansas City region, uh, which we're finding is larger than we thought. Um, a compilation of detailed information about each and initial design thinking regarding the creation of a KC source link like navigable resource rail to facilitate um, connecting potential beneficiaries with resources and um, also connecting health equity and digital equity programs with each other to explore potential collaboration. So um, this is kind of the methodology for this semester. Uh, we start out by reviewing the final report that the last semester did. Uh, we all reviewed it and kind of came together on what we gathered from it. We created a, and had it vetted, but a detailed interview questionnaire for each sub team. Um, do you, you have copies of the No, I, I dropped the ball on that. So I, <laughs> That's I will make sure that I circulate to everybody here who's named at the questionnaires that you developed. That was my fault. I was supposed to bring the photocopy. So, blame okay. me. Um, review. So, then we had the Urban, uh, UMKC Urban Initiative Survey. This was about 40, um, 40 different projects going on in UMKC. And so, from there, we had to see who was leading each project and um, the different, like the medical school, the pharmacy school, the dental school, and so it kind of sent us all over the place, um, including here at the business school. And so we, we did a lot, um, we looked through all of those. Conducting interviews of knowledgeable individuals, um, using repositories for capturing information gathered in the interviews, that's something we're still kind of working on and addressing, and independent research and analysis by each sub team. 
and Bill kind of talked about that as well. Uh, for our side, we had uh, several interviews that involved uh, a lot of different things. Some of the, the first interviews we did were research projects. So uh, where they're not interventions that are ongoing and a resource that people in the community could use, um, other professionals in our field can look to those research projects. And they're, they're really great, they're really interesting. But also in doing that, especially the childhood obesity one and the diabetes intervention, um, and also the geospatial analysis one is also a research project. So looking at kind of at those, continuing, we had some other ones. Um, and there are a, there's a lot of overlap between, um, like a lot of different people are working on diabetes and a lot of people are working on aging. So it's kind of cool to see where everything comes together. Um, my last interview was the one I did yesterday, actually, and we, we wanted to get some feedback on our survey, even still, after we had done some interviews to see, uh, just get some further feedback. And so when I, my main goal was, if you were the one leading all these programs, what would you want this survey to look like? Would, would it, is it too much to ask you this, or would you rather fill it out yourself? Would you rather someone work with you one-on-one? -on -one? And so it was really good to get that feedback. We're finding that, the professors would rather talk to students one-on-one -on -one about the projects than like have to fill it out themselves, which I get is very time consuming. Um, so the lessons learned, like I said, the methodology of the projects completed by some of the professors and students around you in KC, um, those interviewed can be utilized and applied to our project as a whole. Most of the products or projects utilize an ad, um, advisory council, and so these are usually made up of uh, different people in the community, both inside, outside UMKC, professionals in the field, um, community members who are struggling with the different things like diabetes or whatever, whatever it may be. And so we were, so when they used the advisory council, they were able to talk with that advisory council in different points of the process, to gather advice to ensure that they were accomplishing their goals. So this project can be benefited by the advice and recommendations recommendations of the Health Equity Institute, um, considering their various backgrounds, knowledge, and expertise. I think there's about 30 people, is what I heard yesterday, that would come to one of those uh, meetings. So development of a relationship between Health Equity Institute and the students involved each semester in this project, I think would be beneficial to both the institute and to the students' project. Uh, Many projects, specifically the project on childhood obesity, recognize that there are multiple levels of influence and intervention. Um, the family and friends level, the government and regulation level, it just, it, 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 there's a lot of levels. And so identifying the different levels of interventions and not just various categories of interventions um, is beneficial for this project. Also, it is important to know that while this project aims to identify resources in the community, like I said, valuable research or valuable information comes from the research um, that everyone's doing around UMKC and otherwise, um, and the interventions that have come to an end, which I'll address why a lot of that is. Um, not a new lesson, but funding is a big issue, especially in healthcare and um, these projects that a lot of people across UMKC are wanting to do. Um, for both existing interventions and um, also sustainability, um, getting keeping that funding coming every year if they get the funding for two years and then they run out of funding and they've got this grand project that just kind of ends. So that's been a really big problem. Um, of the projects, interventions, and programs that our team has learned about, the funding seems to come from some of the same resources in Kansas City, especially Health Forward Foundation. I have yet to work with anybody specifically at that foundation, but I do think it would be beneficial to establish a relationship with them. Uh, that way we can identify the projects that they're, that they're funding that we do, may not know about um, and that we can gather information on this. So the last thing, sustainability is really big. Um, I'm finding that to like accomplish these goals, it should aim for an institutional base and not be dependent on Person because then that person gets busy or is out on maternity leave or whatever it may be, and then nothing is done for like a period of time, and then it you know just kind of falls off. So sustainability and like an institutional base has been really important. So next steps for our sub team, 
Um, some additional interviews over the next couple of weeks. I've reached out to the School of Pharmacy because they have lots of community service projects that I'm really interested in. Um, also, APHA, which is the American Pharmacist Association, they're very involved, so they're a regional Kansas City team I'd like to get with. We'd like to expand the interview list. We know we can't get to all of these interviews this semester with the project being due in three weeks, but I would like to have like a started list for next semester on uh, who they should start interviewing um, once they get up and running. And this would probably include reaching out to Health Board Foundation. Uh, future semester teams will need to recruit more individuals to conduct research and complete existing um, research on existing interventions. Uh, this is a big project, and our team is small, <laughs> so it's hard to do all that. Like, if you consider everything that the Kansas City area is doing, and there is so much, like it is, it's incredible. And we just we don't have the manpower to interview all these people. So I would I would like to recommend recruiting more people. And then, like I said, begin to develop a relationship between the Health Equity Institute and students each semester. So. Um, we, this was started, like I said, by sending uh, the survey last night and kind of talking it over, but um, I'd like to encourage that relationship moving forward. And I'll turn it over to Michael. All right, so um, this, we kind of got spun off into uh, this sub-team on digital inclusion, digital equity, and digital training. Um, and so our goal is to sort of identify those resources that already exist in the KC community that would mesh in with the health outcome disparities, um, but that focus specifically on that digital side of it, on like kind of bridging the digital divide. So we did several interviews, several of our people who we interviewed are in here today. Um, and so what I did with these is I actually recorded um, as many of the interviews as I could so that I could listen back to them, and that's been super helpful for me so far. Um, but one of the ones that I want to highlight right now um, is actually the last complete interview that we did with Dara McCann who uh, works for SourceLink. She's on the national level for SourceLink. Um, and she basically had like, I should have gone to her first because she had uh, sort of the methodology for like, how do you create this survey and how do you identify these people? And so my, like, we'll get to this at the end, but my big recommendation is to like, hit SourceLink first and then uh, do your interviews on this because uh, the suggestions that she gave me of like coming up with concrete terms that like everybody can use the same terms to talk about these digital inclusion projects and, and those type of things. It's like that would be that would have been helpful in vetting my survey at the beginning. Um, but we'll go ahead and move on to some of the interview observations. And so most of this actually comes from just uh, one interview that I've listened back to and analyzed and Rick, that was the interview I did with you. Yep. I do the first one that I've got to just due to time. Um, but basically what we see is Kansas City has the, the Coalition for Digital Inclusion. Um, and so there's already quite a bit of collaboration going on. Most of the coalition members kind of know what each other is doing. Um, they really just don't have sort of the infrastructure, like a, they don't have a resource rail built out. They don't have a calendar system where they can all submit um, their events to one calendar. Um, and then the city itself has the Digital Equity Strategic Plan. And so Rick actually shared uh, a, a lot of information on the Google Drive with me. Um, so. There was information from the Higher KC uh, Youth Digital Scholars Program, where they actually took pieces of the digital equity strategic plan and uh, sort of those students did some projects on them and identified ways that they could actually be implemented. Um, and then there were there's documents that outline several collaborations the city has. Um, we'll actually have, well, I don't have the names of what, what these things stand for, besides HUD, obviously I don't know what that means. Um, but, but there are several like national level uh, National Digital Inclusion, Inclusion Association and those type of things where the city had been sort of has been working on this for a while. Um, sort of the problem that we see and, and that Rick has identified is that it seems to be plateauing. Um, there seems to be, you know, you have sort of a lack of um, not motivation necessarily, but a lack of steam in some of these projects where, um, you know, everybody's doing their own thing, but they don't know necessarily how to get together and make sure that everybody's communicating. And I think that overcoming Midwestern humility is like everybody's doing great stuff, but not everybody wants to brag on what they're doing. Um, and then we see, generally speaking, that sort of the equity of digital inclusion is the part that's lacking. Um, so you have a lot of entrepreneurial resources, um, 
people of certain socioeconomic status or students that kind of already have sort of a base level could uh, utilize some resources for digital inclusion to kind of get themselves up to speed. Um, but there's a large uh, like subsection of people that aren't even able, they, they have no concept of like what the device does. So you have to kind of overcome the fact that there's, there's resources out there, but they're not directed necessarily at the people who can most benefit from uh, inclusion. Um, and then what we find is like an overarching kind of theme in digital inclusion in Kansas City is the three-legged stool approach. I think that's an overarching theme, theme generally. Um, so that's being able to have access to affordable uh, like broadband speed internet or higher, um, being able to have access to a device, whether that's a laptop, mobile device, um, a personal computer of any kind, and then the training and skills to kind of be able to utilize your device. Um, but there was a, a, a different approach that came sort of uh, from one interview that we had uh, with the Hispanic Economic Development Corporation, is what I should say, in my council, uh, with Gabriel Romero. Um, he kind of had this idea of it's you can't just you can't just train people to use devices the way that we use them right now. Uh, you have to kind of give them the idea that this device opens up kind of a different world of possibilities for them, and so. You give them the skills to like utilize it on a base level, and then you direct them to kind of collaborate and be creative with uh, sort of the digital technology that you're giving them, so that they're not limited by the training. So that the training doesn't produce someone who only knows how to utilize a word processor or only knows how to get on the internet and like, go to Facebook. Because honestly, that's not, I mean, that's not the purpose of the training, though. That wouldn't be what it's supposed to be for. Um, and then again, I'm highlighting source link. So SourceLink basically already has all of the, the methodology and like the resources as far as software goes to build out kind of the resource road that we envision. Um, our problem right now is we don't necessarily have like the concrete terms to describe uh, what digital equity programs are, like what the different levels are. That was a big problem, I think, in that you know, test that we faced was like, where how do we categorize different levels of training? What makes something a basic training versus an intermediate training? Um, you know, obviously, like coding is a sort of an advanced thing, but you know, how do you how do you work people up to being able to even engage in that type of uh, type of training? Yeah. And then again, uh, like Sarah mentioned, funding, community engagement, um, and visibility is something that you know has been lacking um, in the digital equity space somewhat. And so that that's like the thing that you know everybody needs to be on the same page on this as far as like how do we push this forward. Um, and then as far as our next steps for, for putting together our final report, um, we have one pending interview to kind of go over. Uh, and then like I said, I have recordings of um, our interviews that I'm going to be listening back to. And you know, I have, I have the Google Doc up there, but uh, just one 45 minute recording of Rick, I had like three pages of notes and like bullet points to hit, so I couldn't have possibly put them all up on this slide. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I envision that every other interview is going to end up like that for me. I'm going to have like 15 or 20 pages of notes. There's uh, no page on the final report. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Uh, and then also, Rick, I need to bust into kind of all that information you sent me on those Google Docs because as I'm going through it, I'm realizing that I just skimmed the surface and there was so much in there that, that like the city's already done, already recorded, and especially you had a, a spreadsheet uh, put together where you had like listed out all these different people who were already working on it. It's a little out of date, I think, just because yeah. it hasn't been updated recently. Um, but that, that to me is something that the next team could utilize and kind of expand on and, and make it a more robust kind of, uh, you know, to capture all those data points that we wanted to hit and that we started hitting with our survey um, and to put those into that spreadsheet so that it, you know, it actually could serve as a foundation for like the resource rail. They need together, and then um, most of the nonprofits that we interviewed, you know, they have annual reports, and so I'm going to be kind of tracking all those down and trying to put them all together, um, just so we can see, you know, where is the funding coming from for these different nonprofits that are working in these areas, and we can do it in an easier way than like having to interview them and, and try to like, you know, get that out of them because most people don't really want to tell you. Um, and then yeah, like I said, I think. Our, the next step for this team is, is going to be meeting with source like early next semester, um, breaking down like how we need to describe this and being able to put it in concrete terms and being able to explain those um, to people who are working in this space 
so that they can tell us like where they line up with how we're identifying uh, these different programs. And with that, any questions? So I would ask, and I don't know if it's already been addressed or not, identifying who the digital divide applies to. Mm -hmm. So what is that spectrum? Because because we think we understand who that target audience is, but the more people I talk to, and I see you got an interview coming up with Deborah, it's it's enlightening who it is that you haven't even included yet, you know, in that. So if you could somehow identify who all these efforts are focused at, that would be great because it's it's very broad and kind of wishy-washy. Uh, the second second, and this is the question: What do you think causes that plateauing? Why do you think there's either loss of interest or not much done towards it from a from a consolidated perspective or something that you can point to. Why, why did you say that plateauing? I think uh, it might be like a kind of a motivation thing because some of these projects have been going on for a long time. I know like Google Fiber came into the city and that kind of sparked um, the sort of digital inclusion talks in the city, but that was like 10 years ago. So there's just like sustaining effort over that much time uh, kind of, you know, it just, at, at points it can lead to kind of fall off as far as like coordination. I guess the question is on what some of the standards are, because depending what your resources are, there's different standards on what helps people to bridge that digital divide. Do you see that, that disparity, that difference of opinions of, does everyone need a computer? Does everyone need a laptop? Does everyone need Wi-Fi in their home? Is that contributing to that at all from your perspective or not? I think, I don't know because I don't know that everyone necessarily needs like a PC, but everyone probably needs a internet accessible device of some sort. So there's, I think, sort of identifying what level of connectivity you need is is a is, could be a big factor. Let me just interject one thing. We are at the University of Missouri. We have a team here that kind of put together a cross system team. Is looking at broadband for all across Missouri. So mm -hmm. we're gathering a lot of research on adoption of what would happen if we've got high speed in more mm -hmm. places. Uh, but it's you have to have the training to go with it. So some of that research will be feeding the next meeting to fix this up because of the system wide thing. Uh, Leslie and then Amanda. So um, one thing, so I spent a year as a digital inclusion fellow, I was in the first cohort. Um, and so this is my wheelhouse um, for a year or more. Really, you, you never get out of it after you really understand the problem. So there's there's certainly access and there's there's adoption, but relevance is kind of you know in in the middle of that. And I think that when I'm thinking about the plateauing, it's like you can only get so far with access and adoption if the relevance piece isn't isn't there. So. Um, the the point about um, you know how do you how do you get people um, interested in how do they how do you get it to be relevant? Um, I'm currently at uh, Community Housing of Wyandotte County, and, and one of the things that that we see is that um, health issues are the, one of the biggest causes of financial crisis um, for individuals. So when you're thinking about um, this intersection of digital inclusion and, and health equity, I mean, it's most certainly there, right? And then you have all these other um, issues that are getting so much attention and momentum in the city, including um, the uh, work on evictions and, and affordable housing. So I would just encourage you to think about um, when you're talking to funders, what are they thinking about how we um, start moving some of that uh, collective impact around health equity? And how do we think about other seemingly um, unrelated things on the surface, but they're very related, right? Because um, you have digital tools that will help you avoid that uh, you know, $35 soda that you might buy at the, at the convenience store because you don't know that you're on the brink of, of an overdraft, right? So you buy a dollar, but you, know, you have the $35 charge. So, you know, and that can lead somebody into a payday loan. It could, you know, all the things that um, spirals down. 
So um, just thinking about all those different other related pieces um, when you're thinking about health equity um, in, in a broader perspective. And I would suggest you reach out to Aaron Deacon at KC Digital Drive if you haven't already um, on the health stuff that they are doing. <laughs> Amanda, right, this is next. Then we'll get a question from Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. um, no, I was just going to say, um, for, and maybe this is a next semester thing, but the, the city of Peculiar is actually promoting their Comcast Business Smart Cities approach to faster internet, and, that kind of, and that's probably one of the more, um, when we start getting into rural broadband and access to things like telemedicine and education and, and that kind of stuff, that, that's one of the first sort of in the region that is sticking their neck out on doing that. And DeSoto Canvas is another one that um, would be interesting case studies on rural broadband access. And we will be. And what, it's really, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of interesting things that cooperatives are doing. It turns out the uh, Missouri Office of Broadband and their leader, Tim Arbery, that lives in, in the summer, we've got the end Friday. So we'll be, yeah. One of the things that's apparent from the, listening to the teams is these projects some of them are so ambitious they don't get done in one semester, and that's okay. So we just have to make sure we make a good handoff with a lot of detail for it. So okay, Facebook Live question. So, so our, our proof of concept for digital inclusion through <laughs> Facebook Live is working because we're also a distance working here with Professor Suni, who's watching at home online right now, <laughs> who has a question of whether you've explored the role that KC Public Library is playing in this space. Yes, so we actually we took our survey to Carrie Coogan and Wendy Pearson to have them vet it. Um, and then I, I don't actually have an interview recorded with them, but I know that uh, the public libraries do a lot of digital training. They actually let me on um, like KC Library Digital Learn. Um, and that's kind of become more of a standard. Um, a lot of organizations that we've talked to uh, knew about North Star digital training, and then they had moved away from North Star towards um, digital learn because they found it to be uh, easier to access for most people. And I'm just, they, for some reason, I don't think digital, I don't think North Star was living up to their standard. Um, and then other organizations were kind of developing in house programs that incorporated uh, different uh, things that were already going on. But I know the library uh, offers different levels of digital training and they offer them pretty continuously. So they're kind of a big player in this, and I think utilizing the libraries, um, I think they already have a calendaring system, but I'm not sure if I'm looking for that. But utilizing their, whatever kind of resources they already have would be an important part of this. Because whoever, like, if someone already has the calendaring system built out, the best thing for me would be, like, to link everybody to them first and say, okay, proof of concept, like, just put, see if you can all schedule and, like, coordinate yourselves so that people are, you know, you're getting uh, sort of trainings going, not just during the workday nine to five, but like the Hispanic Economic Development Corporation usually does them in the evenings because most of their people work during the day. Um, and so that's that's something where I think the library could be, a, a, again, an enormous resource and that's somewhere like that should be your number two step is like, look at, look at the library's programs and see who else is doing kind of similar. It's, it's interesting. The library was our first stop when we started this this Missouri system wide broadband thing. We talked to them and I talked to them again and said, "Okay, so is there like a network of libraries across Missouri so we can get?" And the answer really was not so much. They don't have like a, a they don't have like a statewide library. Okay, coalition. so nationally there is, but the yeah, state, the state right? They didn't really, because so we're thinking of trying to build that out a little bit and using this as one of the ways to. Yeah. So you had a question. Then? Yeah. So I was going to say on the spreadsheet that that I shared with you. That was uh, an attempt that I had a few years back with the coalition members to share that spreadsheet with them and have them line out um, what services they're providing, the hours that those services are out there, uh, what demographic population they're trying to serve, what geography they're trying to serve in the region. Um, and, uh, and then I got a little edgy with them when uh, I was asking about funding sources, who are your funders, how do you, uh, where do you find employees? So it'll be great to work with the students in the next semester um, because what we find in all these projects is people um, are much more open when students approach them on these topics <laughs> than when local government leaders do. So we appreciate your support. And, yeah. All right, I think we better move on to the other teams. Thank you. So,
uh, clear my record team is coming up. Uh, so a lot of you know this from uh, before, right before we got started, but uh, Professor Suni was unable to be here tonight because she's under the weather. She's the leader of this team, uh, but also importantly, without her, we wouldn't have this course. She launched the law school into the connections between technology, public policy, and access to justice uh, several years ago. That led to the Kaufman event that then in turn led to this course. So Ellen's really the, the fuel of this whole thing. And she has been very, very involved as the, the really the lead mentor with a lot of other mentors who are here today too of the Clear My Record, Criminal Records Expungement Project that you're going to hear about now. Do you want us to put the screen up or are you okay? Oh, no, yeah, we're going to that. Okay. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, we are really glad that you guys are all here today. Uh, my name is Myrna Michael. This is Johnson Brown and Greta Marita. Um, and we are part of the Clear My Record project team. So Clear My Record is basically a collaboration by the KC School of Law um, and the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office and Cook County County. So what does Clear My Record do? Um, basically, it offers free access to legal assistance for those who are seeking expungement um, in Missouri and who maybe can't afford a lawyer. So this is especially targeted for indigent or modest means folks, but uh, this is really a resource that we want to have available for the community in general. So we want everyone to have access to this um, quickly. And um, this is just our website, um, but Really, our end goal with this project is for people to go to our case management website, which we're going to be talking about in a little bit, um, and to know their eligibility status within a few minutes with or without the assistance of an attorney. So we want to make sure that we're not um, kind of forcing people to pay heavy fees for an attorney if they can afford it. Um, and basically, we want them, to, we want to be able to help them obtain the forms necessary to be able to file their petitions from the case management website that we talked about. And um, also, we want to uh, basically represent them through our expungement clinic. Um, and so this is kind of where we come into play because we've been able to kind of get the behind the scenes behind how attorneys um, have been able to help indigent folks. So our short-term goals for my record project is um, we want to process the preliminary background checks for as many applicants as possible. So um, the amount of applicants that we have is actually shot up from last semester. So we have approximately 900 people that we need to get through, um, which is a lot, and that's probably only going to grow with time. And so our goal is we want to get through as many of these people as possible. Um, because these people need they, they need our help. Um, and so we want to be able to get back to them as soon as possible, especially those who have um, already had a background check done. And um, we want to be able to know, notify them of the next step of what needs to happen. And also we want to be able to file petitions for those who appear to qualify for expungement in court. And also, um, one of the short-term goals that we've been able to accomplish this semester is to be able to gain a deeper understanding of the current Missouri statute, which we will also be talking about, um, which is incredibly long, super complex, um, and very difficult to process. So we want to be able to just kind of clarify and boil down the language of that statute. And then the long-term kind of overarching goals is we want to get as many people as possible expunged from expungement day, which was a day that was hosted last semester. Um, so we had people that came in that had already kind of applied for expungement, but we also had walk-in clients. Um, and so we want to be able to kind of get them processed as soon as possible so that they're just not, they're not waiting. Um, and we want to offer people a second chance for a better life. We just feel like it's very counterproductive to kind of have people in this repetitive cycle of having offenses um, on the record that could get cleared, but it's just kind of staying on the record. And now they can't get a job. They can't 
um, they're just not eligible for employment or insurance benefits or health benefits. And so it's just a huge um, impediment for them. And we were aware that um, Missouri prisons just do not have any more money to spend on the prison system. So it would just be better if we're able to get these people kind of back into society to remove the stigma of offenses and to have them um, be productive members. And we also want to make the record searching and processing more simplified because right now um, what we're, we're using two kind of databases to extract uh, the client's data. So we're using Lexis and we're using CaseNet. But the problem is that both of these databases have different information for each client. And so it's very messy to use when you're having a switch back and forth um, and kind of having to compile that is just very confusing. So ultimately, we want to be able to just have one database with all the client's information on it, and we want them to be able to know their expungement status um, through that database. Okay. So what we have accomplished so far is we've had um, two big events. We had a legislative day where we met with different attorneys, um, prosecutors, defense attorneys. We met with um, Mr. Chris Kopecki was there as well. We had a few attorneys from um, Southern Missouri as well, and Senator Kiki Curl, the Missouri Senator. And we all came together to discuss the statute that is currently out that allows people to file or sell file for um, expungement with an attorney or um, on their own. So what we um, established that day was that this statute is difficult to read for an everyday person that's just looking to see if they can get their criminal record clear. So what's going on right now is the language is very, um, it's inconsistent, it's complex. There's different um, criteria in different areas of the statute, so they're not able to see all in one place. What do I need to do to get expunged? Um, when can I not be expunged? Who do I go to for these services? <coughs> so that's what we got to discuss um, with them. And we got to also compare with the Kansas expungement process, because um, Mr. Chris Kopecki is a judge over in Kansas. And here in Missouri, you can get one felony, two misdemeanors expunged. That is it for a lifetime. In Kansas, however, it's a little bit more progressive. They have an unlimited amount of expungements. So just across a couple miles across the um, border, we have people that can get expunged all of their criminal record, have those opportunities, get their rights restored. But here in Missouri, you have to figure out if you have several charges or offenses, figure out which ones are going to get you the best bet. It's kind of like him monopoly. Which properties are going to get you the most money? Which ones are going to help you be the most successful? We did recently have a meeting with um, St. Louis County Prosecutor Wesley Bell and his team. So they came on and they came on over here and we kind of discussed with them, with Dean Sumi, about what are the best ways that we can incorporate this um, work and this project over on the St. Louis side. And they were more than happy to, even then at the tables, agree, let's get this going. This is work we want to do and help people in St. Louis as well and all over Missouri to get expunged when they have a criminal record that they can get relief. Um, we've also been working with the case management system, which is, which is I'm going to show you in just a second. Um, it's a system that IU made for us, he's not here right now, but he made the system so that we can manually go through, check background, um, and just file clients in order from what we have from expungement day, because as we'll show you in just a second, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of information that we need and we need to upload, so that it's all universal. Anyone can go in and start from where someone stopped and finish that process for them. Also, we've been working with the current statute, which we've had, we spent a few days actually drafting the statute, cutting it into pieces, putting it in understandable terms and words, because even when we have attorneys in the room, judges in the room, Dean Sunni in the room, this statute is very difficult to determine and to figure out when someone is just every day, eighth grade reading level, is trying to file for expungement when that's not necessarily possible for them. I just wanted to add in one extra thing. Um, so Senator Curl did say that right now the Missouri legislature is not really ready to move in a more progressive direction with the current expungement statute, but um, she is really hopeful that in the future there will be bipartisan support for it because it will benefit both sides. I mean, I think just this year in May, I think it's spread an article that said that they hadn't updated it. So, I mean, who knows when they're going to do it next since it was just this recent. 
Yeah, they just updated it in May and also August 28th because they added a new charge, which is stealing to the benefits, which we'll show you here. Um, in just a second, I'll go here really quickly. This is where we have to file everything through. I just want to show this page so you can kind of see this is what our user show um, built for us. I don't want to, we didn't want to show anyone's personal information, but this is just our dashboard when we log in. We have eligibility review, closed cases, preliminary review, and then each person has this kind of like profile so we can go through, organize, um, get cases closed. We either contact that patient or client through um, email or phone number if we're able to. But the, there's key pieces of personal information that we need. We need a name, we need a birthday so we can identify them in our databases to um, get their background information. We also need um, a phone number that we can access them through and um, for that email. And then it'd be nice to have a home address as well. What we did discuss for further um, semesters and new students coming in for next semester, we would like to have um, even next of kin, someone we can reach if we can't necessarily contact that person immediately. Because if they are eligible for expungement, they serve the full sentence, pay the restitution, and they are eligible, we just can't contact them, it'd be nice to at least get a hold of them. We already have their information here, we already have the petition file, at least we can do is let them know, hey, we can move forward with your case. And so what we have to do now is manually, we have to pull up a Lexis background check, a case map background check, which can get very complicated because they don't always parallel. They're not always the same in the two. Some things that show up in Lexis will not be on case map and vice versa. And then from there, we have to look at specific charges to see if that one is included in the statute that can be expunged. If it is not, we have to immediately let them know, hey, these charges cannot be expunged. We cannot help you further. We also have to see the state where this um, offense was Happen. So if it's in Missouri, we can help. If it's outside of Missouri, we need to let them know, I'm sorry, we cannot help you at this time. We have to look at those dates because the important thing is not the date that the offense was committed, but the date that the sentence was given and the date that the sentence was completed. We can only file for expungement seven years after a felony sentence was completed. And um, I believe it is three years after a misdemeanor was completed or for an arrest three years after that arrest and um, happen on that date. And so all this information we need to get into their file onto our case management system. So that way if I leave off a couple weeks later, Greta sees something, she can pick up right where we left off. We can contact that client, let them know, hey, we can move forward to your expungement, let's get that petition filed. Or you know what, we have to give you a little bit more information or we're not able to get you expunged here in Missouri. Your um, offenses are from Nebraska, so you might have to reach out to you somewhere there. And so again, I'll just go back to this system here. So this is where we file everything. Of course, this is going to be blank, but this is where we put all that information in to get moving forward. So of course, they had the law students talk about the statute because that would only make sense, right? Unfortunately, I was not much help, and I think we can agree that the attorneys and the judge even wasn't that much help when it came to dissecting this statute. It was, I mean. We have, we, this is a slide here that shows, I mean, this is the statute. This is the entire statute. So we had to do a whole process of just narrowing it down and trying to simplify it as much as possible to, you know, um, to kind of understand it. A little bit more. And uh, we keep going. Uh, <laughs> this is a simplified summary. Yes, this is a simplified oh, summary right here. Oh, but as you can see, it is extremely, extremely complicated. And I'm not a very uh, graph or a view type, type of this kind of person. I like linear stuff, but honestly, this is where it starts. This is, this is, this is how we narrowed it down. This is what we have. Um, it's been, I mean, I don't even know where, where it does start. Right here? Yeah. So basically, we start from what requirements he needs to apply uh, to actually get expunged. And then we ask the question, well, what do you want to get expunged? And then we see all the convictions that they have. And then we get to see, we need to know if they're even expungible or not. And then after that, we continue with how many can be expunged. And it just goes on and on. And the person has to file it. The court does its thing. The FBI, the FBI gets involved. LexisNexis gets involved. Every other court, like every other report gathering type of organization gets involved. And then finally you get expungement. But even if you do get expungement, 
you don't get everything that you thought you would get. Such as, you know, not all right. I mean, all rights should be restored, but there are some limitations on that. But as you can see, this is what we came, what came out of this to try and kind of explain it in the easiest terms. Like she said earlier, in like an eighth grade type of reading level, um, and to because if you were to read this, I mean, you have things that don't even make sense. You don't even understand why it's here and not something else. Like we were doing, uh, we did a case just recently where this lady had multiple different convictions, but unfortunately, there was this conviction she had that there was no law that exists for it anymore. Like the Missouri law has been like rewritten into another law, so we we couldn't we could, had to figure out well can we still help her even though that's not a crime anymore or that specific crime does not exist in our statute anymore. So what do we do because this statute says nothing about it? So we have to sit there we have to determine well what is the best way we can help her or if we can't get this expunged can we get something else expunged? But if, what if that's the biggest thing she has on a record that she wants to get expunged? So we've honestly been left with a lot more questions than, <laughs> than I think we started with, only because when we start get, getting down to the nitty gritty, we realize there's still so many questions that are left you know, open. There are, still, there are still not enough answers that we can get, even after doing all of this, because it's all relative to whatever the crime the person has committed. So, uh, but here's our process too. This is where, where we actually initially started is on the whiteboard, just kind of writing everything out, drafting everything out. And then someone had the brilliant idea of putting it on a, <laughs> on a linear type of you know, flow chart to make it more accessible and to, so we can carry it anywhere we want. And we can just show it to people when we meet with them, this is what the process is. So, I mean, if we ever get to actually sit down with these clients, I think this would be a pretty clear way of saying, hey, look, this is the entire process. You know, we're going to ask you these questions. This is what you're going to need to bring to us. Make it, you know, make it as easier for on us as it is, you know what I mean? So we can do what we need to do. So, but basically what we first figured out is what we've learned. And that's that one, these are the simpler stuff, that one felony and two misdemeanors can be expunged. Um, a felony has to be expunged after seven years of a completed sentence of one to be completely all done and the misdemeanor after three years. Um, so there's a multiple people that have a bunch of infractions, and that's because it's minor little things. Unfortunately, speeding and driving without a license and all those are actual misdemeanors. So if you guys have had those and you paid a ticket, a fine for having you know driving without a license or driving without without registered license plates, what have you, they are misdemeanors in, in Missouri. So you will. Have, so if I look up your name, you might pop up for having those misdemeanors. So if you want to get those expunged, you probably should, because <laughs> they are on your record. And that's what I found out to be the most interesting is little tiny kind of things like that. Um, it can be a snowball effect. Yeah. Because, I mean, let's say that you do have this on your record, and then now you can't pay the fine, and then a police stops you on the road. Now, you know, you're getting arrested. And so it just kind of just a good time to go to court because you got time to go into your employment, which is giving you the money to, mm -hmm. you know, pay for the ticket or provide for your kids. And then, you know, it just it's a wealth exercise for the individual, it pays up your family, employment, education, housing, you know, everything. I mean, I was I was I had just happened to look at my brother, older brother's a truck driver, and I was like, I wonder if all these misdemeanors, like these normal people are getting driving on the road, I wonder what he got. I mean, he has like 10, and that's because they're so strict with what truck drivers can and can't do, and what, what their trucks to look like and operate. I, just, I called him and I was like, you need to get this figured out because you have way too many misdemeanors, and he had no idea because he just thought it was a fine. So these are the things that people, common people do not realize is if you get pulled over and you don't have your driver's license, you're most, and you get a ticket, you have a misdemeanor. These are not infractions. So of course, you can only get one, or what is it, re exposure? Yeah, I think, right? Yeah, so don't all jump on case net at the same time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but just so you know, if you did get pulled over any of those instances, you probably have a misdemeanor, so check it out. <laughs> I just wanted to say one thing. So you probably noticed here, um, all these note cards are kind of in different colors. That's because the statute is so disorganized that certain subsections, when we kind of broke this down and we started pulling different subsections out, we realized that 
different subsections actually fit better with each other than how it was organized in the statute. So um, the qualifications of Rollins for expungement or in different sections of the statute, they were all listed together. Um, the process the court needs, um, takes to file that um, petition or in different sections of, uh, of the statute, they were all filed together. The outcomes of filing for expungement and when you have to disclose and not disclose that expungement, which not necessarily like as confidential as you would like it to be, um, those are all different sections of the statute as well. So we. They're all different colors because we took that section and then we just figured out where it needs to go for a better understanding for the client. And then the nerf branding thing is the last thing that this that the statute says is nothing in this section shall be construed to limit or restrict the availability of expungement to any person under any any other law. So this is, this might not even be the only law that you can get expunged, but how do we know that without yeah? So there is there's any yeah so this this statute honestly is just a mess and i i we get why it's this way but it definitely needs to be simplified and i think that every attorney that's handling expungement should probably view our uh, our little flow chart i think one thing i found super shocking is that even after you think you got everything expunged and everything's fine they can still disclose this information to employers so it's not like you're just kind of free now, it, it's still it's still something that kind of sticks with you and it, it shouldn't. Also, um, other than that outcome, there is outcome with the FBI. So you can go through the court, you can file for expungement, you can have everything done, all your institution paid, your sentence served, you file for expungement through the court, they accept it, you're good to go. Shows up on your background check when you're going for a job. The FBI has not process that paperwork so it's still there it should not be there but is that your right restored to get employment to wherever you would choose to get employment that is not you cannot go purchase a firearm or get a license for a firearm is that your right restored that's where it gets messy because a lot of um secondary <coughs> lawyers they have people clients that got expunged but they still can't get a license for a firearm they can't go hunting kids is that your rights being restored or is that your rights being limited that's why it's all right <coughs> I think it highlights that, I mean, when we're thinking about the lawmakers that created this statute, probably not attorneys. They don't really understand the language and the, the negative effects of having certain words within the statute that, you know, creates all of these loopholes, all of these obstacles. It's like the statute was just created kind of for one person in one situation, in one dimension. They didn't see this as kind of being so multifaceted with so many different layers. And that's what's so kind of shocking when you're looking at this. You're like, if, if lawyers, I mean, even within our group, we were having so many disagreements. We were like, you know, what does, what does this, you know, uh, subsection mean? Um, and so we kind of have to consider, well, if, if attorneys can't even kind of piece this out, um, how can we get just ordinary people who are just looking to get their um, records clear? How, how can we get them to understand all of this? And how can they file without an attorney that they can't do? Yeah. So we urge our lawmakers to uh, hire some attorneys or something <laughs> and figure out how to rewrite this whole expungement statute. Or just use the word paper. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, did uh, you look at the legislative history, or is there any legislative history? Oh, uh, we don't. I have not looked at it, but I'm just, I oh. bet it's, it's changed a lot, yeah. though. I mean, and now that we've just had um, this feeling added, that kind of we had to go back and reevaluate yeah. all of those clients yeah. that first could be expunged yeah. that had stealing on the record. As of August 28th, of course, at the beginning of the semester, we, they already had filed all these people into our case management system. Stealing was added, so we had to go back through all of those people again. And if they had stealing, that could be expunged. We had to add that too. So we had to kind of start over from ground one. <laughs> so just like well, reinterpreting the language over and over again to kind of help the people out that didn't, you know, that weren't eligible beforehand. So and I don't even think about this, but I can't I couldn't imagine what would happen if you're going through the process and you're in the middle of the process and all of a sudden the law were to change. How does that affect you? Can you like what if you're in court proceedings already? How does that affect you if the law is changing constantly? Also, does constantly. it impact you at all? So how does it work if the courts file for that petition, but they have to change it with the FBI yes. and it takes stealing off the list? And that's what you reference to us. Will that affect your expungement? Will that affect your ability to be able to get a job? Or how basically we're just, we're still confused. Basically, <laughs> is what this whole project we're trying we're trying to narrow things down. We're trying to figure it out, but it's just been it's just been a lot of work and. Honestly, most of our time has been spent on 
trying to just figure this out. Yeah, I mean, before we've really been able to hash through the cases, it's just we need to know what the statute means. We need to know its implications and the, the cause and effects of this. So I would say really our main takeaway point is that all of these factors that we talked about impact the feasibility and the effectiveness of, of our projects in general because you know we want to be able to provide the quickest, most effective route of expungement. Um, however, you know, the statute, it's just the perfect example of how laws that are meant to um, help clients are just kind of doing the exact opposite. And so uh, we are just trying to look for ways to make it more accessible, even just changing the name expungement, because, you know, expungement just sounds like kind of intimidating. I didn't really know what the word expungement meant until I joined this team. Um, but even just changing it to clear my records that people kind of understand that this shouldn't be the super daunting task that anyone, you know, anyone should be able to have the ability to, to get their record cleared. So. Open to questions now? Yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we yeah, have a lot of questions. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. uh, so in the mayor's office, we're working on cars and municipal marijuana offenses when they're standalone offenses. Um, and we took a lot of the same steps that you did and, and ran into a lot of the same problems and ultimately decided to start linking it to expungements. Uh, so I'm over here texting my team, so we'll probably be reaching out. So I'm interested in what your next steps are, for, I guess, for the next team next semester, um, how we can work together on that, because we actually have some resources to throw into that. Um, there was a few other, I, I saw you brought together like, the Jackson County Prosecutor, um, Leslie Bell and all that. KCK was trying to do something around this recently. They just started a few months ago. Did you all have it? Yeah, so we did. So our DA's office had a very, it was almost like a pilot in how we set it up. Um, my office wasn't terribly involved, but so I think what they were doing is they were trying to case manage these in person. Yeah. That's what's you know, really interesting about this model is that, um, I mean, the capacity to do so many more. Um, yeah. You were using, was it Civic CRM? Is that what the. Uh, pros? You own KCA because our. I would like to wait for the Civic. Yeah, I don't okay. know what the. Um, because we, you know, figured out that really a Google form wouldn't work for us. So we were also trying to solve that exact problem. Basically, maybe we should just talk afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah we were like, yeah. I know yeah. DCD would love to get anyone that wants to. Yeah. yeah, on board for this conference, she wants to get everyone involved. Like she's very yeah. dedicated to this. She's brought a lot of um, great people together and we've been able to talk about this and find different ways we can do it across the state. Um, there was an issue, actually she had a client that she brought to our list of day that had a pardon, but it still showed up on his background check. And yeah. so he still wasn't able to um, yeah. apply. Mm -hmm. And that's where it got difficult for him. So I know D2 would probably love to talk about that with you if that's what your office is working on. Here. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, the police department is so much deeper than the pardon. Yeah. Um, so we want to kind of first step the pardon and then look at the fund and stuff. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just talk okay, to you. Yeah. We'll try to make this in a, like an online accessible format. Yeah. So, yeah. so we, yeah, yeah, we can do the yeah. mind thing. One thing you mentioned that you <laughs> have a few times. Are you about to use a yeah. law firm librarian here? Also, he's a law student, but he's like our tech genius and he does this kind of case management stuff and he does it really quickly. Right. And, so he's a real asset to the private too. But yeah, they had some funding from Jackson County too. They just mm -hmm. sort of support, so it was really good. So I mean, this is exactly what we're looking for: is this kind of okay? How can we help? And if, if KCK is sharing, this is exactly what we want to do. Others, I I don't know. I'm just curious. I know you mentioned you're a law law school student. What what are your? Uh, we're undergraduate. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a senior. You or I'm a. Probably science and criminal justice. Maybe. Okay. I'm a political science major and history minor. So. Okay. So you guys are kind of in the social justice yeah. space, okay. even to try and continue. Yeah, I'm going to off, so I'll be graduating in May. Fine. And then <laughs> one one quick question about um, sentence being um, completed. So if somebody's on parole, does that mean um, after their they're off paper. Is that when? So when their parole is completed, seven days from that date. And they completed December 12th, 2017. Yeah, sorry, seven years from that date. Okay. And without any other crimes or charges happening in that meantime, because if that happens, it starts the clock over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
And that includes those misdemeanors that I'm talking about, the little tiny drop yeah, the license. Yeah, it starts your whole. Yeah. Don't forget Michael, to do all Michael that. Michael's next down the end of that ramp. Keep a score now. <laughs> so, if I could give you a little bit of insider on like the legislature, they do have uh, they do have legal research. They do have lawyers that work for them. Mm -hmm. What they often do is like iteratively a sort of update statute, and so that's why you get a statute that looks like that is because lawyers just take it and they're like, oh. A policy like a lawmaker wants this section added and they're like where can I fit that in and like how does this work and then they just write it in there they don't they, yeah. they pay no attention to like the overarching structure yeah. of the statute and whether or not it makes sense I feel like that's where things like mixed up like yeah. they all of that three lawyers oh yeah I'm sure if you can <laughs> if you can see the receipts no, of like all the things I think the students mentioned we have a legislation draft in the class here mm -hmm. so we can go figure which one they are so Amanda yeah, thought about and then Brian and oh. then Richard can I, can I offer yeah, well, yeah. Uh, take take this possibly to Representative Tony Lukemeyer. He's just north of here in, in Platte County, but he's actually on. Uh, he's the chair of the Judicial Committee um, in our state legislature, so he could clean that up. <laughs> so what I was going to suggest is similar to this, but I, I don't know. Obviously, this has not been part of the statewide red tape reduction process over the past few years. But I don't know if that's ongoing. That was the previous administration, and I'm not really sure where that stands. But I know they were going through department by department, clarifying language and removing dead law stuff and removing all of these things from state statutes. And they were taking public comment. And so your report could be valuable if you were submitting it to the red tape reduction process to cleaning up the study. You know, in addition to getting people through it and interpreting it, there could be value in trying to get this to the state, I don't know, the governor's office or whoever. But um, if that red tape reduction process is still ongoing, there could be value in trying to submit this to that. Rick? Yeah, so, so this is all the conversation about the dead letter office that yeah. we open every now and then to figure out what archaic uh, law exists in the code of ordinances at City Hall, but like you're saying, in state law. And uh, so I'm really interested, though, in what was that woman convicted of that's no longer a crime? It was, uh, it was, a, so it was a felony. It was listed as a felony class B because she was on school property with drugs. Oh, attempting, yes. So that's what she was doing, but they lowered it down to, to an attempt class. to distribute drugs on the property. So it was originally a class A yeah. felony. She yeah. pled guilty to a class B felony. Attempt, but the yes. attempt was no longer a, a statute. That so was that was statute. no longer. Yeah. So it's a whole separate statute, but it's so not. So this whole. Yeah. And, and the, the way <laughs> the, that, that catch all at the end is kind of the way that legislators and lawmakers. Yeah. Just find a way of not having to go back and find all the conflicts that might exist, mm -hmm. and that's the challenge we have, like in that regulatory due diligence model as well. Just, uh, the challenge so. is to try and make this as consistent as possible, because, like with that lady's situation, right? I mean, different attorneys are going to have kind of different different ideas or different takes on okay, what which which class are we going to be going with to, to determine um, if she can get this expunged or not? So. Oh, so Ellen. So yeah, well, Professor Suni has been commenting, and I haven't been noticing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I did. So she's she started with a comment that said there's no formal legislative history, and I asked what that was in reference to, and she said there's been discussion with some legislators at the time. Uh, Julie Justice, who was on the legislature at the time, will be the primary drafts person of the bill that will be pre-filed this session, and uh, yeah, that's the extent of what she's bringing. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, you know, at the federal level, you always see really detailed legislative history. What's the president? I like, was a tax lawyer, so I see this all the time. Really change about, yeah. What's the present law? What's the reason for change? And really watch it through. And it'd be nice if that was a more widespread process. Uh, uh, Brian? Yeah, I just, all this discussion about the process. In software engineering, we have what they're called design patterns, which are basically kind of standard approaches to this is how you might solve different types of problems. We also have what are called design anti patterns, thinking about that as doing that we shouldn't, but we end up doing anyway. And in software engineering, this sort of approach, oh, let's tweak this, let's tweak this, let's insert this one thing over here. That whole process leads to what is known as the big ball of mud. <laughs> okay? And and that that's what when you're describing this, this, this process, it's like that's that's what you've got. 
You know, now the standard software engineering approach is throw it out and start over with a proper design methodology. I understand it's not the right option here, but yeah, you know, this is this is just a mess. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And since Dean Tooney is not actually here, there was one thing I did want to say on her behalf because something that she gets very angry about, <laughs> and I know she'll agree with me right now. That whenever someone is expunged, the outcome, there's more reasons they have to disclose their expungement, and there's only really one reason why they do not. And that's because the employer does not ask in that situation. But there's so many reasons why they would have to expunge for it have to disclose their expungement. They're getting a license, or just get permit issued by the state, if they want to work with insurance, if they want to get a license for gaming, firearms, weapons, if they want to work at a bank, if they want to work at a credit union, if they work in a savings institution. There's so many instances where you do have to disclose that. So her question is, is this really true expungement? Are you really getting your rights back? Is this really confidential? Right. Because so many times tools. are you telling everyone, yeah. hey, I've been expunged, when that shouldn't even be the case. You should be like, I don't have a criminal record. I want this job. <laughs> it's just back to the idea that, you know, even if you do end up getting something expunged, it still kind of sticks with you. you. You never fully get rid of it. So, you know, the job just happens to not ask. Right. So, like, what what kind of, I mean, it just doesn't offer anybody an incentive to go get their record cleared if they know that it's going to be this time consuming, this just so, I mean, so process intensive. Um, and so we want to kind of provide that avenue for, for our clients so that um, they're not kind of going back into that repetitive cycle of just, you know, if I'm not doing this. Uh, two things. The first one, when you have a uh, picture of like the uh, like, uh, session on it there, I think there were three different numbers for the Senate bill, which might have been if they all three passed, they then would have had to go to the committee to reconcile mm -hmm. all of them. Uh, so that would probably be why you have a bunch of stuff thrown together in addition to as it's may continue. And then the other thing was if lobbying was something you were looking into, it might be still for your class. We could always talk to the associate students at the University of Missouri. That'd be me. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know they do a lot with that. Yes. That'd be like the project type thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm yes. a legislative director, so yeah, oh, bring that to me and we'll make sure that cool. you get this out. All right, all right, all right. Cool. 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 I just have one more. Oh, okay. So this, this makes me really excited. Um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so, doing that exercise, like I'm hearing from you guys that you feel confused right now about this. If you dug into something that hard and you asked, the right questions, chances are you guys you guys have actually figured out your deal. I think you have. I think this exercise by itself embodies everything this class is about. Because otherwise, every you know, at this this is the law that we all have to deal with. But how does that actually affect human beings? You know, if we were to go through this process, which to me looks like you know the, the human being's perspective on legislative history. We enacted this law for a reason. Why is that? Um, I think doing this, if you were to do this with every statute and every regulation you ever touch, um, you would probably understand it 10 times better than the lawmaker and put it into action. Don't you probably back your contract with one on either? Yeah. Dissecting the restatements. Well, and <laughs> now, now they're living the you know step one of design thinking, the empathy part. Could have happened before, but now it's really yes. happening now because they're trying to use it and they're going to inform what needs to happen here. But it was incredibly eye opening when he and Dawson being undergrads and just kind of see this is just a little yeah. snippet of what what law students are doing. Well, and, and you said this is a do it yourself process, wasn't it? You can self file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're thinking. Like, good luck. Because if your lawyer can't read it, what do you mean you can read it? You know. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's as usual the most fun we have. It's great. Uh, I will say about the snacks in the back. I think the reason I forgot the copies for the second team was I was busy getting the snacks, and that's not a reflection of my priorities, but to make me feel less guilty, please take some of the snacks. Hey, that's, uh, that's a good question.